communion. Communion. 26, Matthew 26, 26. Let's just go straight into it. You've been here before in communion? Yeah, plenty of times. Now, I like reading the Bible. If you know Freddie Mundraby personally, on a personal level, I like reading the Bible and getting the Bible and relating it to me where I'm alive, right here and now in the living, so I can apply it in my life so that it may bear fruit and be impactful towards me. Now, I just want to encourage you as an individual, when you read the Bible, find those stories, relate to those stories. So I relate to the story, you know, it's, it's about remembering, remembering. We're putting God in His remembrance here when He says to t- do this in remembrance of me. This is my blood, this is, you know, drink this, this, this symbol here. This is like a, a tangible offering that we're, we're honoring our Heavenly Father, our Bimbiguppi, Father God in my language. Um, something tangible that we can feel. Yet, the Holy Spirit and Jesus and Father God, He's, he's there, but that's, that's just more saying an edification to us because greater works that we are meant to do as believers for we yet believe and yet uh, we didn't see, you know? So we're meant to do greater works in Jesus' name. I'm getting off topic here. I might start preaching, Pastor Steve, you can put your feet up. I'm just kidding. I'll go back to communion. Uh, if we can... You know, it's remembering, honoring, and it's a tangible relationship feeling. So you're giving honor to Heavenly Father and Jesus in doing this. And if we can read on, if we're all there, can we get an amen? 26, Matthew 26. Amen. Amen. And as we are eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. Take, eat. This is my body. What does that mean? To you as an individual. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was, you know, chastised for our our transgression. You know, he he hung on that dead tree for us. That we may have life and life more abundantly. Amen. Like, get some of this word into you. Into your spirit, man. Into your body. And and try and relate it to you personally where you're at here. Because we're meant to have the very best here in the land of the living. Where are you alive? Take a deep breath. You're here, right now in the land of living. Your, your, um, your eternity with Heavenly Father, it's already done when you've accepted Jesus into your heart. But you're, gonna meant to, you're meant to have the very best right here where you're walking, where you're walking upright, when you put your head down. Everything across the board. Blessings. Amen. And if we read on, and it says, um, then he took the cup, this one here, and gave the thanks, and gave, it, gave them saying, drink, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed. Yes, he shed blood for you. This is a man, a man of God. Could have called, called down a, a legion of angels just to just pull the hideousy, that, if that is even a word. Just wipe them straight out, you know. Michael, the archangel, angel, highest part of, of the tallest mountain to the deepest part of the ocean, just one foot, could have just, boom. But no, you know, his body was broken and the blood was shed so that when he had his last final say on the cross, he done for what was before the cross. The people that were mocking, spitting and, and talking down upon him. He did all of that so that we can sit here today in the blessings, in His blood of the Lamb, by the new covenant of Jesus Christ, taking and eating of the bread and the blood. But He said, do this in remembrance for me, for He is alive and well in our hearts and in our life. Amen. Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? So this beautiful family here, this beautiful church, home of God, you know, we'll take the blood, or the bread, the broken body that was eaten as a family, and just pray over it as we go. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your beautiful body, Father God. You're the new covenant, Father God. We just give this, we just give this thanks over to you, Heavenly Father God. And I pray that this, this bread, 
that is a token of your body that was broken for us, Father God. We just give you the, all the honor and all the praise and thank you, Father God. And lift you up and put you in remembrance for what you went and did. Something so beautiful and precious, Father God. You did that for each and every one in this room, each and every one in this world, Father God. You did that for them that they may have life, Father God. We just thank it here today as a family. All take and eat, family. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Mm. And the cup, which represents his blood. Lord Jesus, as we come, come around this, your blood that was spilled, Heavenly Father. Your precious blood that no other, no other names, just at the name of that beautiful blood and that name of Jesus. Yeah, every knee shall bow and tongue confesses power in this blood that, you know, you shed for us, Lord, and gave, you gave it to us for free. For little Mundrabi, uh, Freddie Mundrabi up the backside of far north Queensland, Cairns, and, and Pastor Brett, and, and Pastor Steve, and all the mighty women, and, and men of God, Father God, you did that so that we may have life, Heavenly Father. Uh, we take this and we, we, we honor you in taking a drink. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you very much, family. So honored to be here. Um, the build-up's a little much, though. Now I feel almost pressure <laughs> to go, you know what? But you know what? It's not going to happen because it's the Lord. So first and foremost, I want everybody just to raise your hands. And let's give honor to the one who's truly honorable. Amen. Let's give honor to the one that if it wasn't for him, none of us could do anything. Amen. So we honor you, Father God. We honor you, Jesus. We glorify you. We magnify you. We thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you're going to do. We praise you, Lord, that even this morning as you come into this building or you've been in this building, that you just have your way and not my way, but your way to touch each and every one here. We'll give you glory and we'll give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's funny because... Uh, I used to be a shy guy, if you could believe that. You know, uh, the first time I got up to preach, in, uh, I was a youth pastor. And man, just like the way I became youth pastor, I was out at work and I'm doing my job. I, I had a construction company for 20 years when I was in America. Uh, and I come home and I walk in, I'm putting my gear away. And my wife comes in and goes, oh, by the way, you're now the youth pastor of the church. <laughs> when did that happen? Was I included in the conversation? You know, because if I was, the answer would have been no. I'm just saying, you know. So I love it that we get, get to grow from the no of N-O to the knowing of who we are in Christ. What we're supposed to be doing for Christ and through Christ. Amen. So my title of my message, I don't title my messages very often because most of the time I don't get to preach my full message. So we're going to release our faith. That's the title of my message. We're going to release our faith. All right. Faith is a substance that fuels God. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we have to release our faith. Anybody ever got into a vehicle that had no fuel in the tank? Have you? Where'd you go? <laughs> Nowhere. So with faith, without faith, where are you going to go? Nowhere. So faith is a substance that drives, that pushes. You know, and I love it. I, um, I, I, I just like, I have been accused of being a theologian. I'm not, I'm not that intelligent or unintelligent, whatever way you want to put it. But faith in the Greek is pistis. And it means conviction, confidence, trust, belief, reliance, and trustworthiness, and persuasion. You're persuaded that whatever God says, he's, he's going to do. You're persuaded that the word of God hasn't changed in 2,000 years and is never going to change because Jesus says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he's the same and he was the word made flesh, then the power of the word that worked in Peter's life works in your life. Yeah. Amen? You know, so we're releasing that faith. 
You know, and I love it because in the New Testament it actually means is the divinely implanted principle of the inward confidence, assurance, trust and reliance in God and what he says. The trust and reliance in God and what he says. You ever wonder what God says? Open up your Bible. You know, and, and I keep doing this everywhere I go because I want people to really have a, a revelation. There's 8,000 promises of blessing in this book aimed towards the believers. 8,000. How much is 8,000? 8,000. <laughs> That's a pretty simple answer. 8,000 promises of blessing to the believer. How many believers I got in this house? Oh, come on, how many believers I got in this house? Uh, praise God. You know, and I love it in Galatians 3, 9, it says, So then those who are a people of faith are blessed and made happy. How many of people of faith here are blessed and made happy? Come on. Yeah, we want the happiness and the blessing of God in our lives right now. I don't need it when I'm dead and in heaven because I'm going to be present in the Lord. Amen. Where there's no pain, there's no suffering. I'll have beautiful hair. I'll have no fat on my body. You know, I'll have the best of the best when I'm there. I need it here today. Amen. You don't realize how cold it is until you got no hair and you walk outside and it's nine degrees. All right. Hallelujah. You know, but blessed and made happy and favored by God. You're God's favorite. Come on. You're God's favorite. He favors me more, but you know, anyway, you're God's favorite. He, blessed, happy, and the favor of God in your life when you release your faith. Amen? You know, and believing and trusting just as Abraham did. And I love quoting Romans 4.18, uh, the message translation. Abraham didn't go around asking skeptical questions about the promises of God, but he jumped in head first, fully believing that God was well able to do that which he had promised. He's promised these things. And God, you know, in Numbers 13 says, I don't change my mind. I love that. He doesn't change his mind. So if he promised prosperity, guess what? You're prosperous. If he promised healing, guess what? You're healed. If he promised peace of mind, guess what? You have peaceful mind. It's releasing your faith to take hold of it. I'm trying to get you to have the understanding that, that God's already done his part. It's up to us to do our part. You know, and there's a story in the book of Acts. I got, I'm going to try and preach my notes. Can you believe that, guys? You, uh, all the men are going, how's that possible? He never preached his notes all weekend. You know, you can I can do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Praise God. Amen. You know, but put your finger, if you have a Bible, it's always good to have a Bible when you come to church. All right? So I want you to open up to Romans 12, 3 and Acts 14, 7. Now, Romans 12, 3 says, As God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. As God has dealt to everyone. How many people prayed the prayer of salvation? Hey, Pastor Brad, half your church ain't saved. (laughs) Only like 10 people put up their hands saying they prayed the prayer of salvation. We have an altar call right now. You you need to get saved? Come on up, you know. Uh, But if you've prayed the prayer of salvation, Ephesians tells us, by grace are you saved through faith. So that means you have the measure of faith placed in you. And you know, realize when it says the measure of faith, it's the same measure of faith that Jesus had. That's why Jesus was able to say in John 12, you know, greater works will you do. Greater works will who do? You do. Because God be God, you be you. His word doesn't change. Greater works will you do. You know, it's releasing that. You know, and I love it that that same measure of faith that we have that was Jesus' faith. Jesus did a few things, didn't he? You know, one one place in the book, it says that, in the Bible, it says that if we were to write down all the miracles that he performed, there's no books on the planet, not enough books on the planet to contain it. You ever wondered how that's possible? He fed over 5,000 people with 15 other thousand people present, and each one, you realize that when he broke the bread, can I, I'm just, I'll jump a little bit, all right, stick to my notes, (laughs) I'm going to jump on this for a little bit, right, you know, when he fed the 5,000, do you realize when the miracle occurred? He took the fish, took the loaves, got the 12 guys, and he gave them each a portion, 
Did it suddenly become 10 ton of food when he gave it to each guy? No. So, first miracle. Bam. The 12. And then those who were seated. I love it because in one, translate, uh, one passage it talks about, he said for those who, to sit. And then it says, there were those who didn't. Always got to be the rebellious ones, right? You know? And when, he, when the 12 took it and they started, then they went to the groups of the 100 and the groups of the 50s and the groups of the 25. They broke it again and gave it to them. It didn't decrease. Second miracle. And then the one who was the leader, guess what he was doing? He was continually breaking it, giving it to the next one. Then the next one was breaking it, giving some to the next one. And the next one was breaking it, giving some to the next one. And the next one was breaking it, giving some to the next one. And it never decreased, and everybody ate more than enough. And at the end of it, 12 baskets were gathered. So each person who touched that food, touched that fish, touched that bread, was a part of a miracle. Amen? Amen? Yeah, we read these loaves and fishes type stories and go, oh yeah. Do you realize that everybody involved was part of the miracle and everybody involved had their own personal miracle? They got a full lunch and leftovers from a three-piece fish dinner. Trust me, if you're with Freddie Munjerby, you ain't going to get anything if there's a three-piece fish dinner. For a little guy, he out-eats me. Can you believe that? I still don't know where it goes, but anyhow... Everybody was involved in a miracle and everybody had a personal miracle. That's why it says if they tried to write down every miracle that Jesus performed, there wouldn't be enough books because everybody experienced their own miracle through Christ Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. Now I'll go back to my notes. All right, Acts 14, 7. You know, I love Paul. Anybody like Paul? I do. Amen? He did a few things, you know, and he it was... One of those things in Acts 14, I better get there myself. Don't you love it when you give direction to somebody and then you don't do it? All right. So Acts 14, all right, Paul's preaching. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You know, sometimes we have to have a revelation that if we sit constantly... And don't allow ourselves to open up as a book opens up. Allow ourselves to be exposed. We'll never have the fullness of Christ in our lives. We have to drop our guards, allow our pride to fall to the side, and allow the fullness of Christ to flow in. Just as a dam withholds the river from completing its course, You withholding yourself from Christ hmm, stops him from completing his plan for you. Amen? You have to open yourself up. Hallelujah. Now in Acts 14, Paul's preaching away and there's a lame guy sitting down. Is it alright if I just do it this way? And he's preaching away and that lame guy is sitting there and then it says Paul looks at him. And sees that he has faith to be healed. Was the guy healed? No. But what, did he have faith to be healed? It was evident. So why wasn't the guy healed? Because it hadn't. The faith hadn't been released. And it wasn't Paul's faith, because Paul's looking at him. You got a great man. He was good this weekend, by the way. Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. He's looking at him, and from his countenance, he can see there's an expectation in his faith, which is in his heart, to receive the need, the healing in his body, but he needs that unction, that little spark, to go, hey, I want it, so therefore I've got it. I want it, so therefore I got it. Because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things yet not seen. You want it, so then you've got it. When do you get it? When you believe. When you relieve your, release your faith. You know, I've done a lot of things in my life that are stupid. Don't anybody laugh, all right? And I've always got the result of my foolishness. And I'm like, why in the world did that happen? And then you realize, it's my fault. 
I can't blame anybody, you know, I'm not going to ask anybody else, but, you know, I'm just talking about me. I know you are all wise and you've never messed up once in your life. And, you know, Pastor, you're just talking about yourself because we're perfect, you know. And if you think you're perfect, I know you're in sin because, you know, that's prideful. So then we'll have an altar call for, for your sin, you know. But anyhow, you know, and I've always reaped that harvest. And then when I started walking in the Lord, I started realizing some things. I used to always say, if it wasn't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And I always had bad things showing up in my life. And then I got uh, past uh, Brother Kenneth E. Hagen, and he starts out on 11, 22, 23, 24. The man preached for 67 years in 168 different countries, has 400 books translated into uh, almost uh, 500 languages. He, he did some stuff for the Lord, have five personal visitations of Jesus Christ, and he says, you'll always have whatsoever you say. And I'm like, hmm. And then I realized he didn't say it, Jesus said it. And I'm going, hmm. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy, but one plus one still equals window, right? <laughs> yeah, no, one plus one equals two. So if I'm saying I have nothing but bad luck, what am I going to have? If I'm saying, you know, I'm always broke, I was a product of a family that, that lost everything. We went bankrupt and we lost everything when I was 16 years of age. And, and you know, it was kind of a little bit traumatic time. You know, so for a long time, that was my mentality. And then I realized through Christ Jesus, my past doesn't dictate my present or my future. Amen. 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 What happened back there, because I love Philippians 4, forgetting those things which were behind, or Philippians 3, sorry, forgetting those things that which were behind and striving towards the goals that are out ahead. Amen? You know, and I, just realizing after years and years and years of going, all right, Lord, you said it, I believe it, that settles it. Everybody steals that from Smith Wigglesworth, don't they? You know, you, know, you said it, I believe it, that settles it. And then I started seeing things just change in my life. Just change. And, and just like this man, he's going, I see that you have faith. Rise up. Paul didn't walk up and take him by the hand. He just spoke to the guy and said, rise up. What did the guy have to do for him to receive his healing? He had to act. He had to release his faith and put it into action. How did you guys do this morning? Did you at least make six Ks? You did? Oh, praise God. These guys are crazy. They went and ran a half marathon. <laughs> this body ain't running nowhere. Amen. Yeah. When we release our faith, our faith, it gives God the opportunity to show up big in our lives. You know, like James says, faith without works is dead. And Paul, uh, James also says, you know, you'll talk your faith, but I'll show you my faith by my works. You've got to have the evidence to your faith. You've got to have that evidence that's going to speak to the next person and the next person and the next person. You know, you've got to have the proof that things go on in your life that are in accordance to the Word of God. And I love talking about the guys of old. I, I always get encouraged when I talk about the John G. Lakes or the Smith Wigglesworths or the Oswald J. Smiths or the, you know, Kenneth E. Hagans. But I like talking about me too. Yeah. Oh, everyone's going, oh, look at the prideful man talking about himself. Nah, because I get to testify of what Christ has done for me. Yeah. Amen. You've got to have testimonies of what Christ has done for you. Uh, the first time I, was, I saw an Oswald J. Smith message, like, I'm going to preach that. I really am. But I haven't because the first time he got up, he's a guest minister in a church, and he comes up to the pulpit after he's introduced, and he goes, you make me sick. <laughs> I'm like, oh, Lordy. You know, I'm not going to carry on there. And I'm like, I'm going to do that. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know, he was a great man of God, but, it, but we have to have our own road and put, get into our own lane and do our own thing. And this is what I'm doing right now. You know, in Matthew 8, or oh, Matthew 7, everyone go to Matthew 7. I'm trying to stick to my notes, Pastor Brett. I really am. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, you know the, there's the story of the centurion. And I love it because there's only two places in the Bible. Two places. 
Everyone say two. two. All right. There's 789 places in the Bible that talks about faith. 789 times that faith is mentioned from Genesis to Revelation in the Bible. But there's only two places where it says that faith caused Jesus to marvel. One was this centurion and one was a Syrophoenician woman. My goal is to have Jesus marvel at my faith. Amen? That's my goal. And I, I love that we have to have goals so that we know that we're going to achieve something. Anybody want to achieve something? Well, how are you going to achieve something if you don't know the something that you're trying to achieve? And how do you know that you're going to achieve the something if you don't know what the something is and you don't plan to get to the something? I don't get to Mackay if I don't plan to get in my ute, turn the key, make sure there's a substance in the fuel tank to drive me to here. You know what I'm saying? So how are you going to get your faith answered if you don't have something for your faith to be in action for? How are you going to get there if you don't plan to get there? How are you going to achieve if you don't put the plan into action? Amen? We've got to put our plan into action. Amen? You know, I love that we can... Uh, hmm. Now, i get, get back to my notes, because some things don't need to be said. Hallelujah. So the centurion comes to Jesus. Chapter 8. What well, did I change to 7, didn't I? Uh, that was for free. Thank you. You know, can I tell him Pastor Ken for a moment? I'm going to tell him Pastor Ken. Because I hadn't seen him for a while, a couple months ago. And my wife and I, because, you know, with traveling ministry all the time, we don't attend church as much as we should because I'm out doing this. So I'm, I'm sneaking into this church undercover brother style. You know what I'm saying? We're coming into this church. We've been coming into this church for months and nobody knows who I am. And I love that because, you know, people don't talk to you then. <laughs> people don't expect you to pray for them all the time. You can actually come in, sit down and be fed. I know that sounded a little bit harsh when I said people don't talk to you, because they don't, because they don't know who you are. So there's no draw or affinity. This man gets up from the pulpit. Pastor Steve, you've got such an anointing on your life. and all. You know, people come talk to me all the time now. I'm like, man, I was undercover and everything. <laughs> Praise God. It's okay. I forgive you. So the centurion has a... Uh, a servant that's to the point of death is one translation says. Now when Jesus had entered in, the centurion came to him pleading with him saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And I love it. Jesus is coming to your house. Think about that. Jesus is like, yep, I'm coming. You, need, you got a need? I'm coming to your house. How many would be like, I'm cleaning the house today. I'm going to get there and then I'm going to get on my Instagram and I'm saying, Jesus, come in here. I'm going to get on Facebook. Jesus, come to my house. I'm going to get on Twitter. Yeah, that's, that's you know, and, you know, you're going to announce it to the world that Jesus is coming to your house, right? <laughs> Listen to what this guy says. And then Centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof. To be a centurion in the Roman army means at minimum you have a hundred soldiers under your command and you've done some horrible stuff. You're a fighter. You're a natural born killer. You know what I'm saying? And this centurion is relating his past to his present of who he is. And he's going, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy for you to come into my house. And I love that he now gets into faith, even though he's gone, I'm not worthy, but I've got an understanding of faith that every believer should have. Amen? Amen. Not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. Only speak. Only speak. You don't always need a touch. You don't always need an, uh, now this physical thing. You just need a word. Amen? You just need a word. It goes, only speak. Oh, my page changed. Must be a fan blown, you know. But only speak a word and my servant will be healed. What's he declaring in what he's speaking? His expectation of what Jesus is going to do. 
you realize your expectation is the invitation for the manifestation of God in your life. So if you have no expectation, guess what? You're not having an invitation for the manifestation. Amen? So you need to get your expector expecting. Amen? Hallelujah. All right, cool. Yeah, back here, my page keeps turning, so I'm going to move my notes over here. Praise God. It's not going to work. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. I say to this one, go. You know the thing, if a centurion tells you to do something and you don't do it, not only do they have their sword that they walk around, they don't always carry their shield, but they got their sword for taking somebody out. But they also had this wooden rod that had a ball on the end of it. And it was for correction. So if he told you to go and you didn't do it, guess what you're going to be feeling on some part of your body? You're going to be feeling a whack. So he had an understanding that through his training, that if he's told somebody to go, he had permission to make them go. And he's relating to it going, you know, I'm a man under authority. I told this one to go without a question and without a doubt. He's going. Amen. Do you get that understanding? Without a question and without a doubt, he knew what the action was going to be. You got to get into that point where you have, without question and without doubt, you know what the answer is going to be. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, and says, I tell this one to go and he goes, and I tell this one to come, he comes. Again, he has an understanding of who he is. You know, back in those days, the Romans, if you were going to punish a Roman, you had to have a trial. You couldn't just punish them. If you were a centurion, it didn't matter. You could punish anybody. That's the stature of this man. And he's come to Jesus with the utmost humility going, I'm not worthy. And the other side of it was, remember, if he says for this one to go, he's got to go. If this one to come, he's got to come. He could have commanded Jesus to come. He could have sent out 20 armed men and Jesus couldn't have questioned it and made him come. But he went with the utmost humility going, Lord, I have a need. He didn't get in the natural authority. He got into the spiritual humility. Get into our spiritual humility going, you know, it's already done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, and it says, this one to get, praise God. Come and comes, and to my servant do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, this is the part, he marveled and, and said to those who followed, who are the ones following him? <laughs> Peter, James and John, James the lesser. Wouldn't you hate to have been James the lesser? <laughs> you got James. And John, the sons of thunder. James is the son of thunder. But you, James, the lesser. Oh, man. I was like, no, I would have been rebuking that, you know. But, yeah, so you got James and you got Nathaniel and you got all the guys. The two Judases. The one Judas changed his name. I understand why he changed his name, you know. The 12. And he goes, such great faith haven't I seen in all of Israel. The 12 are going, what are we, chop liver? Think about it. Peter's probably, I gave up my business for you. But Jesus is going, I still didn't see this faith. And the reason I really like this is, I've never seen Jesus' face. I've never been in his presence. But I can get Jesus to marvel at me because of my faith. I'm not a Jew like Peter. I'm not a Jew like James or John. I'm a Infidel, as far as they called it, or a heathen. Just like that Roman centurion, because he was of the Italian guard. Good old. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then Jesus is responding. I love it because that means he responds to anybody who comes to him in faith. Responds to anybody. How many anybodies do we have in this house right now? Amen. That means he's going to respond to your faith. Hallelujah. You know, 
And he marveled and said to those who followed, uh, you know, such great faith. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. This is you. He's going, because of this type of faith, everybody from Australia who declares the name Jesus is going to be in heaven. Everybody in India, everybody in Africa, everybody in America. He's saying everybody's going to have the opportunity to be a part. He's going, this is that type of faith. He's dif differentiating between the Jews and the rest of the world, saying it doesn't matter where you're from. If your faith is activated to accept me, all those things that you have asking for are yes and amen. But the most important thing is you are going to be in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, and I love it that we get to sit here and he goes, boom. As you have said, Go. And your servant is healed. As who has said? You. Me. Sometimes you've got to be you and let God be God. And you'll see the good things of God. But you have to activate it. I'll, uh, you know, I've, I've had some stuff going on in my life. I'm not going to share too many testimonies. You guys heard enough. You know. But I love Abraham. And we blame Sarah all the time. You know, but if you go to Genesis 17, I'm trying to get you to look at something in the sense of, you know, Abraham fell over laughing. Genesis 17, 17, when God's... Because we all blame Sarah. How many times do you, you hear the story about Sarah? Guys, Abraham, the father of faith, had a moment. We're all going to have moments. Yeah, but it's a moment. And a moment shouldn't dictate a lifetime. Amen. A moment is just that thing that comes and goes. Moments should never dictate where you are for the rest of your life. It's amazing how many people, you know, when you're in ministry that come across and the first thing they start talking about is something that happened 20 years ago. And you're like, it was 20 years ago. At what point are you going to release that anchor and grab onto the sail of Jesus Christ and be pulled into the future? At what point are you going to let that go? The sooner you let that go, the further you will go. Amen. Amen? But the more you hold on to that anchor of the past, it's like a boat. As long as an anchor is in the water, where's that boat going? But if it's in a storm, it's going to bob around, right? And get beat up, right? But if it had been released and gone into a place of safety, Amen? You know, we have to let go of those things of the past, whether, even the positive things. I stand on my, the things that God's done for me in the past that are great. I stand on them as a staircase. Because what's a staircase going to do? It goes up. But if you're standing on the bottom step, are you going anywhere? No. I stand on them to, in preparation to move. I stand and keep going up in faith. Amen? Amen? You know, we have Abraham laughed, and then you have Sarah laughed, and then they named Isaac laugh. What's Isaac mean? Ha ha, laughter. Come on, one laughed, the other laughed, and then they named the product laugh. Come on, you know what I'm saying? But when you go, Abraham a moment, Sarah a moment, but the product was still there because they still got back into faith. Even if you get into a little bit of doubt, just step back and go, you know, hang on a second. I know my Lord. I know my Savior. I know what he's done. And I'm going to move forward. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, it's funny. We don't always remember what we do in ministry. Because, well, in my case, because we're traveling all the time and I'm ministering to different people all the time. So, you know, people come up to you and, and they go, do you remember me? And I have to sit there and go, No. And, and they're going, I had this life impact moment with you. I'm like, I'm sorry. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, in 2014, I went to a place called um, uh, Weeper, and I was doing ministry in the indigenous communities, and then I went into a, an AOG church, and I was preaching in that AOG church. And Weeper's about a 13-hour drive up the Cape from where I am. And there's this Samoan couple. And as soon as I get up behind the pulpit, they just start beaming, and, and they're waving at me, and I'm like, oh. Hello. And I've been to Samoa a couple of times. I love that. I'm like, hello. You know, and I'm preaching. And then they come up and they, they hug on me. Pastor Steve, it's been so long. Pastor Steve, it's been so long. I'm like, 
I haven't a clue. I'm like, yes, it's been so long, I don't know who you are. And they said, in 2003, you came to Apia. It's a, in a sovereign Samoa, not American Samoa. I was like, yeah. And you were preaching to the youth at Rhema. I was like, yeah, I remember that. We were the ones walking by who came in, sat down, listened, gave our hearts to the Lord, and then you came up and said, we we're going to serve the Lord. And here we are, nine or 12 years later, in Weeper, serving in this church, getting people saved. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to do when you're operating in faith and who you're going to affect. Because remember, I said faith has to have a testimony. And your testimonies are the ones that you also affect. That you Because you can't take all the stuff. I like having the stuff. Don't, I'm, not, I'm a prosperity preacher. I like the stuff. But the stuff ain't going to be left back here. You know what I'm saying? All I can take glory to heaven with me is souls. Amen? You know, and I love it that these guys are serving, but you don't remember it. Because then you don't take credit for it. It's all glory to God. The one who's the one answering the faith. I can present the buffet. I can present the table. But it's not me who's going to answer your faith. If you're dependent on me, just look at me. I couldn't even hold on to my hair. <laughs> Get that revelation. Nobody grows up going, you know what, I wish I was going to be bored. <laughs> really? Who does that? Well, uh, so it's not me who's going to answer your faith. It's God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that Sarah and, Paul, uh, and Abraham had their moment. But then they, instead of allowing that moment to overtake them, they named the kid the moment. And I say that because they laughed. What's the form of laughter? Joy, merry heart. And the kid was their merry heart. Amen? And we have to get into our faith moment and go, you know what, I want a merry heart. So I need my needs met. I need my needs met. Yeah, it's funny because uh, Freddie's been travelling with us since 2013. Uh, and we've seen a lot of things together. But it was like this trip here. The first time I took Freddie away to do ministry, we were going up through Woodjewel and Hope Vale and, and a couple of other Indigenous communities. And we took... I think 20 people with us and Freddie was one of my drivers and we get there and we're sharing a tent. Right? Freddie, Munjerby and me are sharing a tent. And I, as we're getting to the tent, I said, Freddie, that's your side of the tent. You don't move. This is my side of the tent. I won't move. And this space in the middle is the neutral ground. You stay over there, I stay over here. And, you know, and, and that's how we started, sleeping in a tent with pillows and a blanket, we didn't even have mattresses because we're trying to take care of the team that we got with us. And then today, uh, I told Freddie, uh, Tuesday night, I said, Freddie, we're going. And this is what God's elevated our faith to. And he's like, what, Pastor? I said, you got your motel room with a king-size bed? I got my motel room with a king-size bed. We ain't sharing no tent together on this trip. <laughs> Amen. And you might not think that's much, but when you start out in ministry and you're starting out in tent ministry to get a motel room with a bed in it, that's luxury. Amen? But it's our, my expectation that that's how the standard's got to be. I've got to be on that step going, I'm willing to start in the tent, but I'm not willing to stay in the tent. Amen? You've got to raise that expectation if you want to see it happen. Praise God. You know, Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, you know, we look at it and we, we look at these guys in Hebrews 11 and go, oh my gosh, can we ever achieve? <laughs> Praise God. And the reason I love Hebrews 11, I like all of it, but there's one part of Hebrews 11. <laughs> you know, when you get there and you start realising in verse 32, the names of the people. And what shall I say, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, 
Japheth, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. And then you go, um, Gideon was hiding, so he was in fear. Samson was full of arrogance, and he failed to achieve the fullness of what he was called to do. David sinned multiple times. Samuel got angry. Yet all these guys are in the hall of faith. All these guys who had shortcomings and shortfalls. You know, not the Enoch's and not the Elijah's, but these guys, Samson, Barak, Japheth, David, they're in the hall of fame of faith. And if they can do it in their shortfalls and their shortcomings, I can do it certainly in my shortfalls and my shortcomings. You know, and I love it because we have the understanding that if you cannot be perfection to get your faith answered because Jesus was the only perfect one. Because if anybody could have been perfect, it would have meant that Jesus wouldn't have had to have come and we could have all achieved the perfection of Jesus Christ in it within and within ourselves of the power of ourselves. But you can't. You have to have faith on Jesus, pull me up. I have on my office desk, my wife did it for me, and, and it's a ways, and it says, I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat sitter. I've been saying that for about 21 years. When I was in youth pastorships, that's when I started saying it. Well, I'd rather be a wet water walker than a dry boat sitter. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I'd rather attempt and fail a little bit. How did Peter get back in the boat? Come on. How did Peter get back in the boat? Jesus stretched his hand out, pulled him back up, and they walked on the water. So how did he end, in, end up? He ended in success. He started out in faith, got a little bit of doubt, and then Jesus showed up, strengthened that faith, pulled him up, and he ended in success. I'd rather be the wet water walker than the dry boat sitter. Amen. I'd rather be the one who's attempting to have faith in operation in my life and see some of it come about because I'd be an arrogant man if I said that. Every time I talk about faith, everything happens for me. No, it doesn't. I'm flesh and blood. I miss it just like everybody else. But I'm bold enough to go, all right, that failed. I'm going to try this. I was wrong here, but I may be right here. Amen. I know his voice and another's I will not follow because I know that when he says move in faith, I move in faith. The first time we started Fire Up Men's Ministry in Cairns, Queensland, you know, we started the camp, I went to all these churches and I just got shut down after shut down after shut, shut down, shut down, shut down, shut down. And, I, and we're all, I'm like, we're doing it. And I had Pastor Thor. Yeah, you all know Pastor Thor. I'm sorry that he's your son-in-law and all that. It's okay. <laughs> I, I love him, mean, he's my best mate up there, you know. And I had Pastor Thor and I had two other pastors go, no, we'll support you. So we had 27 guys, my first camp. First night, started service at 7.30, 11.30 service ended. And at one point, me and Thor are the last men standing because there's 25 guys slain in the spirit of and I'm looking at Thor and he's looking at me because he's playing guitar for me. You know, he's, he's leading the worship. And he's like, what do we do? I'm like, oh, do you want me to pray for you? No. <laughs> then I would have been the last man standing. But, you know, but, uh, but, you know, it's taking that step of faith going, you know what we're going to do. Last year we had 74 men from 11 churches from eight different cities attend. <laughs> yeah. Eight different cities were affected from two nights in a camp on the backside of a mountain in Cairns. Eleven churches were affected because men were like, I need more than what I got right now. And faith was answered because how do I know? Because most of the men got touched and there was fruit of it. And it was funny because I got one testimony. There were some kids up there. They were 16 and 17. And they were going through some stuff. And supposedly, and I say supposedly because 90% of the time if I pray for you, I don't remember what I pray for you because it's a funnel. It's God speaking through me. So you know how funnels never retain what's coming? So I don't retain what's, what's happened. And so Monday night I go to pick up some people and, and they're going, do you remember what you said to our sons? And I'm like, they were there? 
<laughs> really? <laughs> cool. Yeah. And they said, you said this, 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 and this. And I said, nah, Jesus said that because I got no recollection. And they said, this happened two weeks later. This happened five months later. This happened last week. I don't even remember praying for them. So what was it? It was their faith in Christ activated Christ to bring the revelation to them and bring the answer to them. Amen? So the same faith that they had and they activated, what are you going to do? Oh, come on. What are you going to do? You know, it's like these light switches. We all know that the power comes from the power point, right? The, the switch. But if nobody goes over and flicks the switch on, what are we doing right now? Sitting in the dark. But does that change the power that's behind the switch? No, it's still there. It's waiting to be activated. And your faith is what's going to activate the power of God in your life. How many people have a need in their lives? All right, I got five truthful, six, seven. All right, praise God. How many people have a want in their lives? I still got five, six, seven. All right, come on. We'll, we'll keep going. A bit. How many have a desire? All right, now we're getting there. Now we're getting there. Because you have to have an understanding that if you want something from God, you've got to go to God with something. Amen? You know, if you have that, uh, I like what one minister used to say, if you have turn up expectation, you're going to get turnips. If you're going, I don't know what I want, well, then you don't, how are you going to get what you don't know what you want? You've got to have the goal. You've got to have the understanding. So what do you want? I love it that, you know, I was sharing with the guys last night about King Hezekiah. And King Hezekiah is in a situation, these armies have come out against him. And they send their representatives with the chopped off heads of kings that they had conquered previously. And they start reading the names of these kings as they're holding their heads in front of him. Going, this king had this size army and these were his gods. They didn't win. And their gods did nothing. And then this king had these gods and this army. Their god didn't do nothing. And then this king, and there was a third one. And then this king, he had this size army. And we defeated it easily. And their god did nothing. Why would you be any different? And he was reading a letter. And I love it because Hezekiah takes the letter. And he could have just stood there and read it going, hmm, I see the decapitated heads. I see that the leftover of the army is standing against me. We either surrender or we fight. Now Hezekiah is like, hmm, give me a minute. And it says he goes to the house of the Lord. I love that. He goes to the house of the Lord. You know, he's got a need. So where's he going? To the house of the Lord. And I love it. He goes up there and he lays that letter out on the table, on the altar. It says he lays the letter out. And then he starts saying, hey, this king, this army, these gods defeated. This king, this army, you know, and he, he repeats what the letter's saying. Because God can't read, apparently. You know, but he, <laughs> you know, so he repeats it all out. And he goes, what are you going to do? God, they're saying their gods didn't do anything. And they're saying, why would we be any different? I got cancer, Lord, what are you going to do? I'm a faith-filled believer. I'm a tither. I'm one who does the word of God. God, I got sickness, what are you going to do? Lord, I have this need. I have financial need. God, what are you going to do? When you hit the ball into God's court, he's got to respond. Because remember it said, he doesn't change his mind. Amen? And I love it when Hezekiah does that. God's like, take your place, stand in your position, and watch. If you don't take your place, and you don't stand in your position, and you don't watch, what was the next thing that happened? One angel came and defeated an army of 185,000. One angel. One angel brought their salvation because he laid out the need on the altar and goes, what are you going to do? 
Not on me, God. They're talking ugly about you, God. Think about it. They're saying, God, what are you going to do? Why would your God be any different? They had gods. They had more than you. You got one God. They had ten gods. Just in numbers, they should have been able to do better. Come on. You know, and I love it that they, they, he didn't get into fear. I'm not saying that we're not going to have those moments of fear. But again, a moment doesn't dictate the lifetime. Fear has to be overcome. How many mountain moving, water walking, overcoming believers do I have in this house right now? Come on. How many gospel preaching, hard on fire believers are going to receive their answer today? Come on. You know, you, you have to get it into yourselves that I'm going to get what I desire because God says that it's mine and it belongs to me to take hold of it. Because Mark 11:22 says, have faith in God and speak to that mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. And whatsoever I say, I'll have with it when I don't doubt because I say it and I believe it. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. You got to put yourself in these verses. I have what I say. Because the word promised it to me. Jesus doesn't change. He's not, he's not going to go in and go, you know what? Yeah, not for you today. It's going to be for the one behind you. There's more than enough in heaven for everybody. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. There's nothing that God can't meet. There's nothing God can't meet. But there's only one thing that can stop God. Look in the mirror. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody stand up. Come on. Hallelujah. The blessing of the Lord brings wealth without painful toil. Proverbs 10.22. Ephesians 3.20 says, Super abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that is in us. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all my needs according to the riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. What's all mean? Everything. All. So what's, what's holding you back? What's holding you back? It's not God. Can you, you play keyboards? Hallelujah. You know, we have to get the understanding that it's going to take you to move. It's going to take you to put faith to it. It's going to take you to activate that your believer is believing for the answer.